Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about some of the new discoveries coming from the Voyager 1 probe that's essentially the farthest object humanity has ever built somewhere out there in the interstellar space. But today I wanted to discuss the mission as well and also just talk about what the scientists found, what it means to our understanding of the galaxy and the universe and more importantly remind you of some of the coolest achievements of this mission. Now as you probably already know Voyager mission is basically two different probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, with both probes taking a slightly different approach or slightly different path out of the solar system. Voyager 1 took this path, flying by Jupiter and Saturn, whereas Voyager 2 also got to visit Uranus and Neptune, with both probes obviously being exactly the same as well. But the mission itself would not be possible without these wonderful people from JPL who essentially proposed this and further pushed for this mission to be developed in the early 70s. But originally there was actually only one person that sort of made all of this start. It was this wonderful person, Gary Flandro, and he back in 1966 completely by accident realized that in the late 70s all four planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune and Uranus are going to align with one another in such a way that you could actually send a spacecraft visiting all four planets using previous planet to provide what's known as the slingshot maneuver. So here Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune align in just a perfect way to create an opportunity for what's known as the Grand Tour, visiting all planets or in this case four major planets with a single mission. And that's basically how the Voyager mission was born. One of the most ambitious, if not the most ambitious NASA missions ever something that cost them close to about 1 billion dollars. And this is actually something that happens once every 175 years. So the next time this is going to be possible, I don't think most of us are going to be around anymore. But the thing is, the original mission design was really only set up to have these probes function for 5 years, from 1977 to roughly around 1982. At least the Voyager 1 probe. Voyager 2, because it also got to visit Neptune, was supposed to function until 1989. And so nobody could predict or expect the probes to function for so long. They've been actually communicating with planet Earth for the past 43 years, as of today, as of 2021. And moreover, they're still actually doing a pretty good job at also sending us a lot of data. NASA created this website specifically for the Voyager missions, allowing us to see the mission status and also showing us some of the parameters that they also get to detect here from planet Earth. It also shows you which instruments are still functioning and which ones have been disabled because there is just not enough power. And more importantly, it also allows you to see exactly where the probes are located in comparison to everything else in the solar system. Earth, by the way, is somewhere right there, very, very close to the center of the solar system. But until 2012, pretty much all of the observations we've been making with all of the other probes as well have always been inside what's known as the heliosphere. Or inside this really, really large plasma bubble that's formed by our sun as it starts emitting various solar winds and a lot of different particles showering the nearby space in these particles. But in 2012, Voyager 1 probe left this particular region and entered the actual interstellar space. The scientists got to detect the helio sheath here and there was quite a lot of exciting reports about this back then as well and now it's traveling in between stars, it's traveling in the interstellar space. And a few years ago when Voyager 2 also reached this particular location, we also got to understand that this whole helio sheath is almost like a plasma wall. It's basically a relatively thick region that both probes had to pass through. But what's really cool about both of the probes is that they've been continuously sending all of the data back to scientists, allowing them to study specific electron densities or plasma densities of various regions in the interstellar space allowing the scientists to start mapping what happens in between stars as well. And there have already been a few pretty interesting discoveries. One of the most recent and most unusual discoveries is in regards to what NASA referred to as the plasma hum. Essentially almost like a humming noise of the background plasma that seems to be present across the interstellar space. And very recently the NASA scientists were able to convert all of these observations into the actual sounds we can hear as well. Now you're going to hear them in a few seconds but essentially this is what we're looking at. Now this is from between 2012 and now and notice how there are at least two different spots here that represent some sort of a really really major plasma wave. But let's just actually hear this first.
And so these seem to represent some sort of um, interstellar plasma waves of what seems to be really large chunks of plasma, or basically gas that's uh, ionized. And according to the scientists, similar observations have been done pretty much every single year. So there are these really large chunks of gas that seem to be spread out across really large vast uh, distances of space in between stars. Now, right now we believe that there are possibly three ways that these can be generated. The smallest of these objects most likely just come from the interactions or from the effects from our sun. And so in this case, various solar eruptions and various shock waves produced by the sun very likely just disturbed the heliosphere and expanded just a little bit, producing these tiny chunks of gas. Now this one here is a little bit exaggerated, but this is just to give you a visual perspective. And so the smallest ones that were detected so far were very likely just produced by the sun and various eruptions. And even though I'm saying small, in terms of the actual size, these would be anywhere from a few million to possibly a few billion kilometers or miles in size. A lot of bigger ones that have not been observed yet would also be produced by various ancient supernova. Now we've seen these with various telescopes, we just haven't seen these with the Voyager craft yet. And a lot of them you can explore on this map that's available in the description below, with the nearest one, the one we're flying through right now, known as the Local Interstellar Cloud. You can sort of learn more about the ideas behind this and what possibly created this in one of the videos somewhere right there. But some of the biggest of these unusual gas clouds and these plasma clouds in the interstellar space are probably created by the galaxy itself. With some of these gas clouds visible as these darker patches all over the galaxy. This is formed by the motion of the galaxy as it rotates. And as various masses interact here, they essentially create various gas-like formations inside galaxies all over the place. But once again, this is not something that the Voyager probe just saw. It only saw the ones from the Sun. And in case you were wondering how it's able to do all of this after 43 years, well the answer to this is first of all is this, the reactor, the RTG that's using nuclear energy to generate electricity, still has approximately 75% of material able to produce energy and provide enough wattage for at least 3 more years, possibly even 4 years. But the actual detection is done with these two long antennae you see sticking out on both sides. These are plasma wave antenna and they both are able to detect the minute vibrations of electrons near the spacecraft. And by detecting those vibrations, it can then transmit the detail and transmit all the data back to Earth. This is known as the Voyager's plasma wave system. And what's really unusual is that after the Voyager left the solar system, the actual density of electrons increased by about 40 times. And so it reached the current levels back in 2015. Which sort of implies that the plasma levels outside of the solar system are slightly higher than just inside of it on the outskirts. But this is of course something that NASA is hoping to learn with some of the new missions, including the currently planned mission that's going to be specifically for the interstellar space. If it ever occurs, it's going to go into the outskirts of the solar system much faster than any craft before, and it's going to reach the same regions of space in only a few years. But right now this is still being planned and it's not even certain if it's ever going to happen. But if this mission does happen, it's going to be a really exciting mission to follow because it's going to help us explore the interstellar space and answer a lot of the questions about the universe, the galaxy where we live, and of course our own existence as well. For now though, we still have approximately 3 to maybe 4 years before Voyager probes officially shut down and officially sort of become retired, but until then the scientists are going to try to get as much data from these probes as possible. In 2025, we're going to come back and talk about this once again. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves to learn about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.